Well, hi everyone. And first of all, I'd like to thank everyone at GoTo who's helped put this event together. It's actually very, very uh, cool. I've been following quite, quite a few talks from yesterday and today and really loved it. It's a great honor for me to be here and, and share the stage with so many cool speakers. I'm very humbled by the invitation. Uh, probably you don't know uh, Casey and, and Nora, I'm not sure she, if she's online, but the Netflix engineering team has been a big influence for me in my professional life. So again, thank you for inviting me and share uh, my thoughts and ideas with you today. For the past few years, I've also had the privilege to uh, be working with some of uh, AWS customers, uh, especially focusing on operational excellence, resilience, and today's topic, which is chaos engineering. I feel privileged because I got to make talk with, listen to, and, and help incredible number of customers, uh, including o Olga Hall, who did the keynote today. Uh, she's been a great mentor for me as well. So today I want to uh, look a little back because as uh, Rachel Carson said, to understand the living present and the promise of the future, it's necessary to remember the past. For those uh, who don't know Rachel, she's an American marine biologist uh, who's been uh, writing a lot of books, especially one called Silent Spring, and she's been crediting with advancing global environmental movements. And I really love this quote, uh, and especially the work she's done. Uh, and today I'm going to try to apply her wisdom to uh, chaos engineering. So as you probably know, by now, chaos engineering is really a process of stressing an application in test or production environment uh, by creating disruptive events, uh, such as a server outage, throttling an API, and so on. And then you observe how the system responds in order to improve the system, right? So, and we do that really to disprove or prove our assumptions about our system's capability to handle disruptive events. Uh, but most important, rather than do it at uh, 3 a.m. In, in the weekend on the production environment, uh, uh, we try to create a control environment uh, during working hours when everyone uh, is at work and fresh and having good coffees. Resilience is one of my favorite topic uh, is, and is commonly quoted, uh, the most quoted benefit for uh, chaos engineering, and rightly so. So, but chaos engineering for me is, 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 is really more than that. Uh, resilience is really the tip of the iceberg, and it also helps uh, expose monitoring and observability blind spots, improve recovery time and operational skills just to name a few. But more importantly, uh, I've learned that chaos engineering triggers remarkable cultural change. And let me ask you a couple of questions uh, before we get started. Do you remember your first outage? How did it feel back then? How confident did you feel? I clearly remember mine and it looked something like this. Yeah, that's me running around. I was really nervous, I was sweating a lot. My heart rate was through the roof. I started to panic and I couldn't think straight. Uh, I felt very, very unprepared. And decision that normally would seem easy felt very, very difficult. And I started to make mistakes, that mistakes that normally wouldn't do. Uh, one of those mistakes was deleting a, product, a database in production. I won't talk about it today because uh, it would take a whole talk, but it was a disaster. I had no idea what I was doing, uh, and it took me an awful lot of time to figure out the issue because I just didn't know where to start. I poked around for a long time trying to figure out what was the issue, and it turned out it was a worker connections setting on the load balancer that exceeded the number of file, uh, open file resources limits in the limits, uh, limits.com file in Linux operating system. It's really a classic, by the way. Today, it would probably take me just a few minutes to get a feel for what was wrong back then. I wasn't trained to fix that or recover from outages. Did you learn to recover outages at school or at university? I didn't. I, I, I think many of us got trained directly on the field during production outage. And trust me, it's not something that is fun. And that actually took me quite a long time to figure out as well. So a few years after the I have no idea what's going on event, I came across this fantastic talk from Jesse Robbins. The talk was called Game Days, Creating Resiliency Through Destruction. 
And in the early 2000s, I know Olga talked about it, but in the early 2000s, Jesse Robbins, uh, who was called a master of disaster at Amazon, created something called the Game Day. And really, the Game Day was created from his experience training as a firefighter. And the firefighters are highly trained specialists that risk lives every day to fighting fires. Did you know that actually firefighters spend approximately 600 hours training before going to active duty? And that's just the beginning. That's, you know, some fighters, some firefighters, according to reports, spend over 80% of their time training. And why do they do this? When firefighters go under life condition, they have to have an intuition for the fire they are fighting against. And to acquire this life-saving intuition, they need to train hours after hours. Like the old adage says, practice makes perfect. So in inspired by his experience as a firefighter, Jesse Robbins created the game day, and it was designed to test, train, and prepare Amazon systems, software, and people to respond to a disaster. And the game day was really created to increase Amazon retail website resilience by purposely injecting failure into critical systems. During this exercise, the tools, the process, the monitoring, the alerts, the on-calls, all were tested and exposed to flaws in the standard incident response capability. So game day actually became really, really good at exposing class classic architectural defects uh, and sometimes also exposing what's called the latent defect. So the problem that appears only because of the failure you've triggered. So for example, you inject a failure and all of a sudden your incident management system, which is critical to the recovery, fails because of the faults. Um, as a firefighter, Jesse Robin brought an emergency responder mindset to his work, and he taught Amazon a few things. First, that data centers distributed worldwide, a large e-commerce and even larger uh, fulfillment uh, operation can have unpredictable and spectacular failures, and they are inevitable. And rather than trying to avoid failure, Jesse Robbins and the game days made it safe for Amazon to fail. So failing safely was something very important. And second, the distributed modularized applications are robust and they enable high level of reliability, availability and resilience. And that became the very good foundation for what eventually became AWS. So in that talk, Jesse Robbins also taught me why it took me ages uh, during the outage to figure out what was wrong. And he says, just as firefighters train to have an intuition to fight live fire, the goal of game days was to help the team build an intuition against live large scale catastrophic failures. And I have come to believe that intuition is really the key to surviving an outage and the key to case engineering, because it's simply the best way that you can, uh, that it can help you gain this intuition. So now the question that I can ask, or that you may ask is how do we do this? So today, the average person consumes approximately 50 gigabytes of data every day. That's a ridiculous amount of data. And how do we deal with this complexity uh, of, of information? How do we cut through and make it essential decisions in life and business? So intuition has received a very big interest lately from scientists, and they found out that actually intuition does exist. Exists. So the scientist and Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, that wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow, which I highly recommend, explains that the brain has two different operating systems, system one and system two. The system one is pretty fast and often related to some conscious uh, way of operating. It's where the feeling intuition dominates. The system two is the slower one, more analytical uh, uh, way of operating. So system one was proved to know the answer uh, in a wide range of situations long before system two. And this is very interesting because he says that, for example, people that were buying cars with intuition were happier 60% of the time than someone that would think carefully about all the options, right? Uh, our intuition is based on emotions and it derived from things that has happened to us in the past, things like 
the fire they, where you got burned. Our intuition remembers, and the more you use it, the more accurate it becomes. However, <laughs> there's, I recently read the book Range from David Epstein, and in the book it says, in the wicked world, relying upon experience from a single domain is not only limiting, it can be disastrous. And he continues, modern work demands knowledge transfer, the ability to apply knowledge to new situations and different domains. Our most fundamental thought process have changed to accommodate increasing complexity and the need to derive new patterns rather than rely on familiar ones. And I could not agree more. In the past few years, the most successful engineering team I've met have been teams with people of very diverse backgrounds and roles. And that's true at Amazon with the two pizza teams in startups, small and medium-sized company and large enterprise. Everywhere, it's the same. So do your team a favor. Uh, let them gain experience in a wide range of skills. When you do game days, change roles. Don't let people do always the same thing. For only when they will have acquired the knowledge required, they'll be able to understand and derive new patterns uh, during unknown outages. Uh, it's, it's something that a David uh, Epstein actually calls interliving. And that refers to the mixings of types of problems you train on so that you know you so that you don't know what's coming next. Uh, so instead of practicing over and over again the same things, focus, uh, uh, focus to understand the structure of a problem instead. After all, how many times have you experienced the same outage twice? It's twice. Of course, it's assuming you fixed the first one in the, uh, uh, initially, right? So come be back to intuitions. According to science, to build an intuition, you have to increase your awareness, fight biases, and train. So how do you increase your awareness? So you have to engage with people. You have to ask questions. You have to look at the data. But most importantly, you have to listen to anecdotes. And we do that a lot at Amazon, actually. Uh, while we use plenty of metrics, uh, Jeff Bezos famously said, uh, I'm a big fan of anecdotes in business. Often the customer anecdotes are more insightful than data. Uh, I've noticed that when anecdotes and the metric disagree, the anecdotes are usually right. So one, one of the most common questions I get, and I heard it today as well a few times, is where do we start with chaos engineering? What kind of hypothesis should we start with? And my favorite answer has become listen to anecdotes. Ask your developer and operation teams, what are you worrying about? That is the most single powerful questions you can ask your team. Because if they worry about something, it's intuition based and it's probably serious. It's actually so serious that this question, what are you worrying about, is part of every operational readiness review we do at Amazon before any service launch. So listen to anecdotes. If several team members worry about the same, same team, rank it up and then design experiments that address this concern. Verify, never assume. All these years I've learned that listening to this intuition has never been a waste of time, quite the opposite. But, and there's always a but. Have you heard the saying, dogs not barking? That's a reference to Sherlock Holmes, one of uh, the story, The Adventure of Silver Blaze. At one point, uh, the inspector Gregory asked Holmes, is there any point to which you uh, wish to draw my attention? And Holmes answer, to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. So Gregory, surprised, answers, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Holmes famously says, that was the curious incident. The lesson of dogs not barking is to pay attention to what isn't there not just what is. Absence is just as normal and important as, uh, as telling, uh, is just as important as presence. So pay attention to absence uh, requires inten uh, intentional focus. So you have to stop and also ask yourself, what are you not worrying about? Uh, if you think about it, increasing our awareness uh, in, is the, really the higher form of monitoring and observability. Uh, simply, it's not limited to software engineering. 
So now let's move to the second one, fighting biases. So interestingly, intuition is, gets often confused with biases. Uh, things like it never happened before, so it shouldn't fail. This is where uh, intuition gets confused with biases. It's the genius inside that actually we should not uh, blindly follow. So how do we distinguish bias from intuition? Uh, when you hear very optimistic intuition, put it to the test and verify. Uh, look for evidence that the intuition might be wrong. Ask yourself, it's something you've seen before. If it isn't, it's a warning sign that something might be more related to bias thinking. Two most common bias that uh, I see a lot during chaos engineering is the confirmation bias and sunk cost fallacy. The confirmation, com the confirmation bias is the tendency to search, interpret, favor, recall information that confirms and support our own uh, and prior personal beliefs and values. The sunk cost fallacy is when people uh, believe that investment uh, further justify expenditure. So your team has spent so much time on the framework that it cannot go out anymore. So experimenting on the system using chaos engineering helps fight these challenges, uh, these uh, biases and assumptions. But you have to be careful because that's a tricky one. Uh, there are different factors that influence biases. In particular, true, it's when team members are really deeply invested into a specific technology and they've spent a lot of time to it. So remember, handle that with care. We all love our code, it's our baby, so be careful with it. So finally, training. So to make, uh, to make it easy to train and improve our intuition, you have to remove friction during training. So our customers have told us that they feel it's very, very hard to get started with chaos engineering. It's hard because currently you have to stitch different tools, scripts, libraries, uh, together to cover the full spectrum of faults you can inject in a system. It's hard because you often have to know programming languages, OS specific functions. Uh, you have to understand the infrastructure, the network, the applications, all have different tools, whether it's a library or an agent. So customers don't want to really install anything extra in their application. Uh, to test it, right? And actually, I'm guilty here as well because I've created quite a bunch of tools, libraries, and scripts, all very different uh, in the last few years. Uh, and that doesn't make any, anyone, uh, it doesn't make it any easy to get started. It's also actually challenging to ensure a safe environment to inject faults. Uh, ideally, you want your tools to stop and roll back if there are any alarms setting off. You also want to integrate nicely with your monitoring solutions. And finally, you want, you know, some of the faults are just really hard to reproduce. So it's really essential to realize that outages rely, uh, don't happen because of one fault, they happen because of combinations of faults that are occurring simultaneously uh, or in sequence. And that's really hard to reproduce. And similarly, uh, if you think how firefighter uh, for a fight in real life uh, situation, uh, the benefit of case engineering experiment really correlates to the accuracy of reproducing like uh, real world situations. So to remove frictions, we've launched uh, something called the uh, uh, fault injection si uh, simulator in 2020 reInvent. Uh, it's the fully managed service and Really, it's, it's focused on making it easier for team to get started. Uh, it lets customer train and learn about the system as easily as possible. We have tr tried hard to remove friction. Um, more importantly, really, uh, fees eliminate the need to complex the managed tooling that uh, usually is needed uh, to, uh, to do that. So it's easy to get started. You can uh, reproduce real world conditions. I don't want to, uh, to retell exactly my previous presentation because I've talked about this at reInvent and the talk is now available on YouTube so you can easily go and see that. Uh, it's a deep dive on the service with plenty of demos. There's a new one that I've done that uh, shows also control plane fault injections with API throttling and also you can see our product manager uh, at, uh, from Fizz talking about the service during the launch of reInvent. But I want to, uh, before giving the floor to Casey, I want to uh, summarize that it's 
really important that to understand that to increase our intuition and fully embrace the benefit of chaos injuring, we have to increase our awareness. And that's, again, the broader domain of monitoring and of observability. We have to set up uh, hypotheses based on intuition and avoid bias. Remember that dogs don't always bark. And finally, we have to use tooling that promotes training and remove friction. So to conclude, I'd like to leave you on this quote from Brian Tracy, which I really, really enjoy. Um, she says, it's not failure itself that holds you back. It's the fear of failure that paralyzes you. So my advice for you today is to try, try things out. There to jump in and embark in your chaos enduring journey for wherever you are. Remember that uh, it's often the first step that is the hardest. Uh, and doing so for me has been the greatest and most gratifying experience of my professional life. So while the discipline itself is amazing, the people here as well and the community surrounding it is where the diamonds are. And that's it for me, uh, folks. Uh, if you are interested, I've, I will post a fully redacted version of that talk on my blog later today. Uh, so again, thank you for inviting me and have a lovely rest of the day.